Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses. As we continue with part 11, the system of symbolic instruction from the symbolism of Freemasonry by Albert G. Mackey. Chapter 10, the system of symbolic instruction. The lectures of the English lodges, which are far more philosophical than our own, although I do not believe that the system itself is in general as philosophically studied by our English brethren as by ourselves, have beautifully defined Freemasonry to be a science of morality, veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols. But allegory itself is nothing else but verbal symbolism. It is the symbol of an idea or of a series of ideas, not presented to the mind in an objective and visible form, but clothed in language and exhibited in the form of a narrative. And therefore the English definition amounts in fact to this, that Freemasonry is a science of morality developed and inculcated by the ancient method of symbolism. It is this peculiar character as a symbolic institution, this entire adoption of the method of instruction by symbolism, which gives its whole identity to Freemasonry and has caused it to differ from every other association that the ingenuity of man has devised. It is this that has bestowed upon it that attractive form which has always secured the attachment of its disciples and its own perpetuity. The Roman Catholic Church is perhaps the only contemporaneous institution which continues to cultivate in any degree the beautiful system of symbolism. But that which in the Catholic Church is in a great measure incidental and the fruit of development is in Freemasonry the very lifeblood and soul of the institution, born with it at its birth, or rather the germ from which the tree has sprung and still giving it support, nourishment and even existence, withdraw from Freemasonry its symbolism and you take from the body its soul, leaving behind nothing but a lifeless mass of effete matter fitted only for a rapid decay. Bishop England, in his explanation of the Mass, says that in every ceremony we must look for three meanings. The first, the literal, natural, and it may be said the original meaning. The second, the figurative or emblematic signification. And thirdly, the pious or religious meaning. Frequently, the two last will be found the same. Sometimes all three will be found combined. Here lies the true difference between the symbolism of the church and that of masonry. In the former, the symbolic meaning was an afterthought applied to the original, literal one. In the latter, the symbolic was always the original signification of every ceremony. Since then, the science of symbolism forms so important a part of the system of Freemasonry, it will be well to commence any discussion of that subject by an investigation of the nature of symbols in general. Was not all the knowledge of the Egyptians writ in mystic symbols, speak not the scriptures oft in parables? Are not the choicest fables of the poets that were the fountains and first springs of wisdom wrapped in perplexed allegories? Ben Jonson, alchemist. There is no science so ancient as that of symbolism and no mode of instruction has ever been so general as was the symbolic in former ages. The first learning in the world, says the great antiquary, Dr. Stukeley, consisted chiefly of symbols. The wisdom of the Chaldeans, Phoenicians, Egyptians, Jews, of Zoroaster, Sanchoniathan, Pherecydes, Cyrus, Pythagoras, Socrates, Plato, of all the ancients that is come to our hand is symbolic. And the learned Faber remarks that allegory and personification were peculiarly agreeable to the genius of antiquity, and the simplicity of truth was continually sacrificed at the shrine of poetical decoration. In fact, man's earliest instruction was by symbols. The objective character of a symbol is best calculated to be grasped by the infant mind, whether the infancy of that mind be considered nationally or individually. And hence, in the first ages of the world, in its infancy, all propositions, theological, political or scientific, were expressed in the form of symbols. Thus, the first religions were eminently symbolical because as that great philosophical historian Grote has remarked, at a time when language was yet in its infancy, visible symbols were the most vivid means of acting upon the minds of ignorant hearers. Again, children received their elementary teaching in symbols. A was an archer. What is this but symbolism? The archer becomes to the infant mind the symbol of the letter A, just as in afterlife the letter becomes to the more advanced mind the symbol of a certain sound of the human voice. And it may be added that the word becomes a symbol of an idea, and hence Harris, in his Hermes, 
defines language to be a system of articulate voices, the symbols of our ideas, but of those principally which are general or universal. The first lesson received by a child in acquiring his alphabet is thus conveyed by symbolism. Even in the very formation of language, the medium of communication between man and man, and which must hence have been an elementary step in the progress of human improvement, it was found necessary to have recourse to symbols, for words are only and truly certain arbitrary symbols by which and through which we give an utterance to our ideas. The construction of language was therefore one of the first products of the science of symbolism. We must constantly bear in mind this fact of the primary existence and predominance of symbolism in the earliest times. When we are investigating the nature of the ancient religions with which the history of Freemasonry is so intimately connected, the older the religion, the more the symbolism abounds. Modern religions may convey their dogmas in abstract propositions. Ancient religions always conveyed them in symbols. Thus, there is more symbolism in the Egyptian religion than in the Jewish, more in the Jewish than in the Christian, more in the Christian than in the Mohammedan, and lastly, more in the Roman than in the Protestant. Symbols, says Muller, are evidently coeval with the human race. They result from the union of the soul with the body in man. Nature has implanted the feeling for them in the human heart. Introduction to a scientific system of mythology, Leitch's translation. R. W. Mackay says, the earliest instruments of education were symbols, the most universal symbols of the multitudinously present deity, being earth or heaven or some selected object, such as the sun or moon, a tree or a stone, familiarly seen in either of them, progress of the intellect. But symbolism is not only the most ancient and general, but it is also the most practically useful of sciences. We have already seen how actively it operates in the early stages of life and of society. We have seen how the first ideas of men and of nations are impressed upon their minds by means of symbols. It was thus that the ancient peoples were almost wholly educated. In the simpler stages of society, says one writer on this subject, mankind can be instructed in the abstract knowledge of truths only by symbols and parables. Hence we find most heathen religions becoming mythic or explaining their mysteries by allegories or instructive incidents. Nay, God himself, knowing the nature of the creatures formed by him, has condescended in the earlier revelations that he made of himself to teach by symbols, and the greatest of all teachers instructed the multitudes by parables. Between the allegory or parable and the symbol, there is, as I have said, no essential difference. The Greek verb paraballo, whence comes the word parable and the verb sumbalo in the same language, which is the root of the word symbol, both have the synonymous meaning to compare. A parable is only a spoken symbol, the definition of a parable given by Adam Clarke is equally applicable to a symbol, viz. a comparison or similitude in which one thing is compared with another, especially spiritual things with natural, by which means these spiritual things are better understood and make a deeper impression on the attentive mind. The great exemplar of the ancient philosophy and the grand archetype of modern philosophy were alike, distinguished by their possessing this faculty in a high degree, and have told us that man was best instructed by similitudes. North British Review, August 1851. Faber passes a similar encomium. Hence the language of symbolism being so purely a language of ideas is in one respect more perfect than any ordinary language can be. It possesses the variegated elegance of synonyms without any of the obscurity which arises from the use of ambiguous terms. Such is the system adopted in Freemasonry for the development and inculcation of the great religious and philosophical truths of which it was, for so many years, the sole conservator. And it is for this reason that I have already remarked that any inquiry into the symbolic character of Freemasonry must be preceded by an investigation of the nature of symbolism in general if we would properly appreciate its particular use in the organization of the Masonic institution. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe and comment and if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Roses links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.